Please open those Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And when we're done with our scripture reading, leave them open right there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to pick it up with verse number 4. Where Paul tells the Corinthians, I give thanks to God always for you because of the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you so that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no dissensions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I am thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that I do not know whether I baptized anyone else because Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Okay, a bit of artwork up there is to remind you that the theme of Corinthians is scolding the saints. The picture features a man chewing out what appears at first glance to be a couple of children. But upon closer look, you see that it's a couple of adults that are acting like children. You see the one on the right there holding a teddy bear and sucking his thumb, and one sitting down with a pacifier and a bib with a bunny and a bottle. And would you scold? A two-year-old because he can't tell you what his times tables are? No, you wouldn't. But if you get somebody who's a teenager who doesn't know what three times six or four times eight and all that sort of thing is, you either send them to Auburn or you scold them. Boo. <laughs> okay. All right. And Paul's admonishment to the Corinthians is, is just summed up in two words. Grow up. Have you met people who refuse to grow up? Yeah. There was a fella in my hometown who uh, his parents had no control over him. If he wanted to do something, he did it. No matter how many times they or somebody else said, no, you can't do that. And he was a good-looking, athletic, charming type of boy. Gave fits to adults, his parents, and the teachers because he was going to do what he wanted to do. Or when he was young, he would throw a tantrum. When he got older, he would just do it. And the other parents in town would tell their boys, I don't want you hanging around with this kid. I want you becoming like him. And uh, fathers would tell their daughters, I don't want you dating this boy. And, and that, was a, that was a tough thing. Because you know how girls are, unsaved girls anyway, uh, about the, the bad boys 
in town, especially if they're really good looking. And Vinny was very good looking and athletic. He was a star athlete and uh, he just uh, he just did all sorts of crazy stuff and he wouldn't take no for an answer. He didn't like boundaries or limitations. And uh, one day in the winter, uh, Vinny and one of his friends decided that they would tie one of these little things. Does anybody recognize that? Of course you don't recognize that. You don't have snow here in Alabama. That's what we called a flying saucer. <laughs> and uh, you would go to the top of the hill in one of these things and you would sit on it and hold on to those straps and you would just slide down the snow. And one of the things about the flying saucer, unlike the sled, is that you had no control over your direction. And you went where this thing took you. Well, they decided during a snowstorm that they would tie one of these things to the back of a pickup truck and tow Vinny along in the flying saucer. You know, we grew up in a very rural area, and that's fine if you're on a straight back road or a dirt road or a farm road or a driveway or something like that, but not on a state highway that goes around like this. And when the truck goes this way, the flying saucer goes into the other lane until it straightens out a little bit, and then the flying saucer comes back behind the pickup truck. Well, before it did, another friend of his coming the other way ran right over Vinny. I would say there are very few people who uh, left this earth on a flying saucer, but Vinny was one of them. All because Vinny refused to grow up. And there are Christians who don't want to put the effort in to grow up. And if we don't grow up in every way into him, who is the head? Who commands the body? The head or the elbow? The head does. And when a body is not responding to the thoughts and directions of the brain, you have a situation such as, like, say, Parkinson's disease, where the body is doing something that the brain doesn't want it to do. And when Christians are not responding to the head, that's just as shameful to our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are to grow up, and if we don't, guess what? We're susceptible to the flaming darts of the evil one, and we will fall into all kinds of sin and mischief. It's important that we grow up. And there in Corinthians, after the opening verses, verses 1 through 9, we start today the big area of correction, primarily correction of their behavior. And the correction part of Corinthians spans 15 of its 16 chapters. Paul's, Paul spends practically the entire book chewing them out for one thing or another. He is definitely on to them, and that's why we had those verses in the beginning where Paul assures them, I really do think that there's evidence that you guys are believers, and he wanted to preface this correction part with that. So today, Problems related to leadership, and it will be division problems. So as we start the section in chapter 1, verse 10 of division problems, we're going to start with the nature of the movement. And the nature of the movement is this. It, is, um, it amounts to the Corinthians following after men. Now, to understand why they think this way. You've got to understand a little bit about Greek philosophy and, and Greek society. They didn't have movie stars. They had some war heroes, but they're not mentioned too much. But they did have philosophers. 
and everybody had a religion or a philosophy. And the heroes of the day were the philosophers. Even Alexander the Great, who made the great kingdom, the Greek kingdom, that spanned over the course of three continents, looked up to Aristotle, the philosopher, who was his teacher. These guys were the movie stars of the day, and only because they didn't have cable TV. And the dinosaurs didn't have cable TV either, and you see what happened to them. So, everybody gave credit to the philosopher for the philosophy that they followed. Because in the Greek mind, if you were eloquent and persuasive enough to persuade me to follow your point of view, then you as a man had the power to change my mind and to make me believe the right thing. So let's transfer that concept over into Christianity. If by chance a Corinthian person would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, he would naturally give credit to the person who proclaimed the gospel to him and persuaded him to believe in Jesus Christ. So where did the credit go to? To the messenger. And even though it manifested itself this way hypothetically by saying, I'm of Paul because he led me to the Lord, or I'm of Apollos, because he led me to the Lord. When we get over to chapter 4, we're going to see that Paul used those names so as not to embarrass the leaders in Corinth. Now, when Paul got to Corinth, he indeed led a number of these people to knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But after that, the leadership of the church, the elders, would preach the gospel, and more and more people would come to know the Lord. And these people were saying, well, this guy does a better job than this guy, because he persuaded me to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's the nature of the movement. It is following after men. At the end of that, in verse number 18, we're going to discuss the nature of the message. And we're going to find out that it's not the messenger, but the message itself that has the power to persuade us to come to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Corinthians were giving credit to certain people, hence Paul's accusation. All right. Now, Paul had enemies in the ministry, and a lot of people were saying, you know, Paul, this apostle fellow, he, he's really a nothing. And one of their assessments of him is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 10, where they say, Paul's letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. And to a Greek person... The power to persuade was in how you worded things. If you were eloquent and dynamic, then you had the power. And the Apostle Paul, in their eyes, did not. I was sought out by the pastor of a newly formed church, which had broken off from a Baptist church over in the Center Point area. He says, uh, your name was given to me, and I'd like you to come over and start teaching our youth, which I did for about a year. And in the course of that, uh, they they said, we, we also need you to teach an adult Sunday school class. And there was about 12 or 14 adults in this adult Sunday school class, and uh, in, the, in the next three weeks, it grew to between 40 and 50 people. After about six weeks, the pastor came to me and said, uh, we have 
a guest this morning that would like to address the Sunday school class. I says, okay, no problem. So I sat there with the rest of the class, and this fella who was probably about three or four inches taller than I, a good 50 pounds heavier than I, dressed in a suit that looked like he came out of the 1930s in one of these skinny little ties, came up to the front of the room. Now, how many of you remember Bob Littlepage? Okay, you remember how Bob talked with that, that voice, that quiet voice? Well, this guy gets up there with this quiet voice, and the first thing he does is he apologizes. He says, I want to apologize for two things. First of all, because I don't have a loud and authoritative voice, because I was born a eunuch. Now, I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but the chances are that uh, the, uh, the testosterone did not affect his body like it does with most males. And he had never married, and he was just kind of a soft-spoken type of guy. He says, the second thing is, I have a horrible sinus infection. So if I stop in the middle of my talk this morning and blow my nose, I'm going to ask that you be merciful to me and patient. We thought, no problem. Okay. The guy tells a little bit about, of him, about himself. He has three PhDs in Semitic languages. He knows ancient and modern Hebrew. He knows Aramaic, and he knows all the Middle Eastern languages. He doesn't just know them. He is the expert in them. If this man were teaching at a university or even a seminary, he could have been making a fortune with his credentials. But you know what he did? He hitchhiked across America, back and forth, east to west, up and down, from north to south. And when he would get to a city, he would look up in the Yellow Pages phone books, you, your parents can explain to you what that was. And he would find out, and you could tell in those days by the name of a church and what they put underneath their Yellow Pages ad, whether they were a conservative church or not. And he would go see the pastor and ask if he could just speak to a Sunday school class or, or even the congregation. And this is what he did as his ministry all across the country. And he says, I'd like you to open your Bibles. And we opened up to something in one of the prophets. And he says, I want to take a look at this verse this morning. And before he even got started, he pulled his handkerchief out and he sneezed. And out came his upper and lower false teeth. And he turned around with his back to us and he put them back in. And he came back almost in tears, apologizing for how embarrassing that is. And that would not be the last time that he did that in the hour that he spoke. And he had this tiny voice. And we all leaned forward so that we could hear every word this man said, which was not persuasive. It was not dynamic. It was not in any way eloquent. And the following week when we all got together, we all declared that it was the most meaningful teacher we had ever encountered. Why? Because God was in it. Not because he was eloquent or persuasive or dynamic, but because, not because of the messenger, but because of the message and what it did in our hearts. His bodily presence was weak and his speech was of no account, but what he accomplished in the hearts of the adults that day was beyond compare. And when Paul came to Corinth, he approached them in a similar way. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God. What's that? That's the gospel, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In lofty words 
or wisdom. And my speech and my message were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? Because that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men or my intelligence or something like that, but in the power of God. There's a man who took this very, very seriously. If you've had American history at all, you know who Jonathan Edwards was. Lived back in the 1700s. If you're a Christian, you should read about him or read some of the things that he wrote. Jonathan Edwards is credited incorrectly because it was the Spirit of God with the great awakening here in America. A revival that just swept through New England and countless number of people got saved. His most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God left congregations screaming, thinking that the floor might open up at any second and devour them down into hell alive, just as with Korah's rebellion. Do you know how he presented it? He read it in a deliberate monotone. Why? That their faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And God used that man and that message in a way to bring Christ to the New England states. It wasn't Jonathan Edwards. It was God. Why is Paul doing this? Why is this important to us? You know, you're going to get another teacher after me and before me there were a bunch of teachers I've met some of them some good some not so good and God accomplished something through each one of them because God accomplished it and every time a church gets a new pastor they say well he wasn't like so and so and he I wish he were more like so and so if he were more dynamic if we had a really dynamic preacher we could fill these pews yeah no no doubt you probably could but guys if anything happens if people get saved if people grow in Christ, it is not because of the pastor. It is because of God. And these Corinthians were giving credit to certain of their leadership and pretty much saying that the rest of them were worthless. We're going to discover more about that in chapters 3 and 4. And this is the nature of of the movement they were giving credit to men and they were following after men i know christians who when a pastor changed churches they followed him to the next church that's following after men The presentation of the problem is found in verses 10 through 16, and it begins with Paul's requirement in verse number 10. Let me read verse number 10 from the RSV, and then I'm going to give you my translation of it. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no dissensions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. And here's my... Uh, and Paul's requirement is uniformity. And here's my translation. Paul says, Now I am appealing to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in order that you all may be saying the same thing. 
and that there may be no schisms among you, but that you may be mended in the same mind and the same opinion. Now, Paul's requirement of uniformity, he's wanting uniformity in their talk, and that's why he says, literally, that you may be saying the same thing. The same thing about <coughs> this issue. And what is that? That any growth, any salvation, has come not from the messenger, but from the Lord through the message. And he wants uniformity in their thought, that you may be mended in the same mind and the same opinion. That means what's going on on the inside matches with what you're saying on the outside. And I want to point out a couple of other things in this verse that will give you an idea of the picture that Paul is painting. He is using a fabric illustration. You see that word schisms? That there may be no schisms. Your, your Bible may say divisions. That your, your Bible may say dissensions. It's really the word for tear. Like a tear in a fabric. So somebody tore his garment because somebody died and he was mourning. Or he was upset about something. That's the word. But that you may be mended. When you guys get a hole in your jeans, what do you do? You do nothing, don't you? In fact, you go out and buy your stinking jeans with holes in them. But when many of us were children, we got jeans and when we got a hole in the knees because we were sliding into third base or something like that, we went home and our mothers would mend it with a patch so that we wouldn't have to go out and buy another pair of jeans so that we could wear it to school because you didn't wear clothes with holes in it to school. And this is what Paul is talking about. That the church must be of the fabric that has no tears in it but that if there are, that they are mended with the proper theology so that everybody is on the same page. And that's what we need to strive for at Oak Grove Baptist Church. And this is why I teach theologically. Because Paul says that we need to grow up in every way into him who is the head until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Referring to the unity of the way we believe and the way we behave. If we're not on the same page, then what are we going to accomplish? If people see us as not united, and each of us following after our heroes, instead of giving God the credit, we're not going to make much of an impact for Jesus Christ. So, 